Good morning. It's good to see all of you here this morning. I hope that you had a great Christmas. I hope that you had a time together with family, maybe even with friends that was sweet. A time to maybe even rest. I know that's really hard to do when we, all we do is go really, really fast. But perhaps even that you're able to take time to think about Jesus. It was his birthday. Why not take that time to think about the fact that he came as a baby and also the fact we know he is coming Again, for those of you that don't know me this morning, though, my name is Jared Ernest. I'm the campus pastor at our Williamsburg campus, and I want to say hi to our Williamsburg family and staff in Williamsburg. It's been an awesome privilege to be able to serve with them, to the people in the community of Williamsburg, but also the students of UC, to be able to see the Lord moving on that campus has been awesome. I also want to say hi to our Richmond campus this morning, Pastor John and Micah, and the other families up there that serve faithfully in Richmond is an awesome thing to see. Knowing that the Lord is moving in that community and in that campus of EKU is a great thing. I know the Lord has more to come for them. And, you know, it's been a real blessing, I would say, just from the bottom of my heart, to be a part of Emmanuel. When Katie and I came nine years ago, I don't think I would imagine that I'd be um, on staff at Emmanuel. Didn't really plan to do that. I was, came as a teacher, and I was okay with that. But, you know, the Lord is faithful, and he moves in awesome ways that we can't, I can't imagine. But I think the biggest thing, the most important thing that has stood out to me at Emmanuel is that we go after the one. We take the Great Commission to heart. We leave the 99 to go after the one. How often do we ask you what's your next step? How often do we ask you who your Waldo is to go after that person that needs to know Jesus? And I think that is such an awesome part of what we do, and I'm glad that we take that seriously. But I don't know about you, when I encounter people at different walks of life, right? They have different beliefs. A lot of people even have an idea of who God is. Some are following him faithfully. Some have some kind of idea of who he is from some church background, and others may be running as far away from him as possible. But what I've encountered, and maybe more it's just the Tri-County area, but I think it's even different parts of the world and in the U.S. that people have an idea, they have an idea that there's this God of the New Testament, and then there's this God of the Old Testament. The one in the New Testament is loving, and, and he's forgiving, and he has mercy. But then there's this God of the Old Testament who is wrathful, and, and he brings judgment, and he is wholly just, and fire and brimstone, right? All that kind of thing. But To be honest, though, if we believe in God, if we believe in who he is, we believe the Bible as well. Guess what? The Old and New Testament are in the Bible, right? They're both there. So we have to believe and understand that he is the same God, that he is the God that is both merciful, yes, but he is also full of wrath, that he is the God that is wholly just, but he's going to forgive you for your sins. And I think that's something we have to take to heart, but also when we share the hope of the gospel to other people, we also need to be aware of that where people are coming from, what they have going on in their lives. They may only see one side, but I think as believers in Jesus, we have to share that with them. But maybe even this morning, if you don't know who Jesus is, and I'm glad you're here, because we're going to spend some time in one of the latter minor prophets of the Old Testament, and we're going to spend some time talking about how God is going to bring judgment and calamity on the city of Judah, the nation of Judah, excuse me, and really even leading up to where uh, the city of Jerusalem is destroyed. But what we're going to see in this book, and we're going to be in the book of Zephaniah, by the way, is that God gives an opportunity for people to turn back to him, an opportunity for them to come back to him. He, he wants people. He wants that relationship. He desires a relationship with you, but also with the nation of Judah then, he wanted them to come back. He wanted that reconciliation. He wanted that fractured relationship to be healed, but he also knew he had to be judgmental. He also knew that he had to be just. He had to be righteous in his judgment in that way. So this morning, though, as we think about the God of the Old Testament, the God of the New Testament, and what it means of who God is, his character, and who he truly is, Hebrews 8.3 kind of gives a little bit of a thought of this, because God doesn't change. Amen that he does not change. That what we read in the Bible is who he is. And 8.3 of Hebrews says, he is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And even Revelation 22.13 says that God speaking, when uh, John, the, pro- the apostle, wrote this, I'm the Alpha and the Omega. The first and the last, the beginning and the end. So if we believe that God, the Old Testament and the New Testament are the same, and we also believe his holy word, then we have to believe that God is who he says he is. He doesn't change, and thankfully so. So this morning, as we spend time in the book of Zephaniah, we're going to see this coming judgment and the warning that Zephaniah lays out to the nation of Judah, but also a coming judgment that we have not seen yet ourselves. But in the midst of that, Zephaniah is going to say, hey, God is telling you that you can still come back. You can still repent of your sins and come back to him. And that is an awesome, vivid picture of who God is. 
that he is just with a passion to rescue the world from human evil and the violence humans do to each other, but also that he is love, that he wants to create a world where people can find love and peace and security in him perfected. So the title of today's message is The Day of the Lord. And to set the stage a little bit, give a little historical context, Zephaniah is proclaiming this warning. He is prophesying what is to come to the nation of Judah because there is a judgment that's to come. They have fallen far away. But after they had fallen far away, King Josiah rose to power. He was king in Judah. And Josiah is described as a man, a king, that did what was right in his own. He did in the eyes of the Lord, excuse me, and walked in all the ways of David. He did not turn to the right or the left. He followed the Lord as the Lord commanded. And you can even find that description in 2 Kings 22, verse 2. Because see, King Josiah had seen what the previous king, King Manasseh, had done. He had led the nation away from from God. They had decided to worship other idols. But Josiah set reforms in place. See, he wanted to restore the nation of Judah back to God. And ever since Zephaniah's great-great-grandfather, Hezekiah, the nation had been far from God in so many different ways. And Josiah knew that he needed to do the right thing to restore them. So he restored the temple. He set the Feast of Passover back in place. And during his reign, the nation actually came back to the Lord. They were able to, in practice and in worship, be able to worship the Lord. But as rebellious people do, and as we often find ourselves doing, once King Josiah was killed in battle, the nation fell away. But they didn't fall away just as they had before. No, no, they fell even further away from God, even more rebellious than they had been before. And because of their rebellious nature, that is why Zephaniah is proclaiming and prophesying this coming judgment on the nation of Judah. And that's where we're going to look today. So if you can open your Bibles this morning, or, or you can even turn in your devices, and you can even go to our app, We Are IBC, if you don't have that. You can follow our notes there, but maybe you even brought a journal this morning. I know sometimes I like to bring a journal. You can even write notes as we go. That would be great as well. But verse 1 of chapter 1 of the book of Zephaniah says this. The word of the Lord that came to Zephaniah, son of Cushi, son of Gedaliah, son of Amariah, son of Hezekiah, in the days of Josiah, son of Ammon, king of Judah. I will completely sweep away everything from the face of the earth. This is the Lord's declaration. I sweep away people and animals. I will sweep away the birds of the sky and the fish of the sea and the ruins along with the wicked. I will cut off mankind from the face of the earth. This is the Lord's declaration. I will stretch up my hand against Judah and I will, against all the residents of Jerusalem. I will cut them off. I will cut off every vestige of Baal from this place. The names of the pagan priests along with the priests. Those who bow in worship on the rooftops, the stars in the sky, those who bow and pledge loyalty to the Lord, but also pledge loyalty to Milcom. And those who turn back from following the Lord, who do not seek the Lord or inquire of him, be silent in the presence of the Lord God. For the day of the Lord is near. Indeed, the Lord has prepared a sacrifice. He has consecrated his guests. Point number one, your outline. On the day of the Lord, God will come in judgment. Verses 2 through 3 clearly point out that the Lord is coming in judgment against all living beings. The judgment is described in terms of a decreation. Notice here that the description is in reverse order of how they are created. Man, beasts, birds, and then fish. And if you think back, back to the days of Noah, the flood was kind of a decreation itself because the Lord has seen the wickedness of man's heart and he sent the flood to wipe out mankind except for Noah and his family. And it's even described then that man's heart, every intention and the thoughts of man's heart was evil continually. But you look at verse 4, it clearly calls out the nation of Judah and their worship of Baal as well. See, verse 4 says, the Lord, the Lord will put it into false worship and cut off Baal. Because at the time, the nation of Judah was worshiping Baal, but also worshiping the Lord. Like they would go worship the Lord and then turn around and was like, okay, I'm going to go worship Baal now. And, and, and that was not okay. God is holy, and that is it. And no other deity, no other man-made deity can even compare. And the day of the Lord that Zephaniah is prophesying, the one that is to come, is the day where the Lord will sweep away everything and nothing will escape his judgment. Nothing at all. Because God is holy and none is like him. He commands us to worship him and to come to him in him alone. And then verses 13 through 18, the rest of the chapter, also point out how it is the great day of the Lord and all will experience his wrath, his pain, his distress, and ultimately his judgment. But in this chapter, Zephaniah is proclaiming the coming judgment to the nation of Judah, yes. And they were ju- judged severely because what he is seeing is a coming judgment of the, these oppressive, na- oppressive nation. And in 2 Kings 25, we find out that the nation that comes to bring judgment, that is the instrument of God's judgment, his wrath, is Babylon. In, in 2 Kings 25, Babylon invades Ju- Jerusalem and lays siege to the city. Many of the people who are killed or exiled. 
and the temple is utterly destroyed. And while that imminent judgment that Zeph- Zephaniah spoke of is what we see then in 2 Kings 25, Zephaniah is also proclaiming another coming judgment. One that he could not foresee at that moment that was happening then, but one that is to come. One that we can know and hope, hope to come, but also we know that will come. <laughs> and while that is the case, we know that Jesus describes it in Matthew 24. Because he talks of a great tribulation on the day of the Lord, this other coming day. Verse 21 and 24 says, For at that time there will be a great distress, the kind that has not taken place from the beginning of the world until it never will again. See, unless those days were cut short, no one would be saved. But those days will be cut short because of the elect. If anyone tells you then, see, here is the Messiah, or over there, do not believe it. For false messiahs and false prophets will arise and perform great signs and wonders to lead astray, if possible, even the elect. And then Jesus goes on to describe in detail what will happen on that exact day in verses 29 through 31. Immediately after the stress of those days, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not shed its light. The stars will fall from the sky and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in the sky. And then all the peoples of the earth will mourn and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. He will send out his angels with a loud trumpet and they will gather his elect from the four winds from one end of the sky to the other. See, the day of the Lord is one where the Lord of hosts will come in righteous judgment. Zephaniah was prophesying the coming judgment, which happened to be through Babylon. And we can even find out, even though he doesn't know that, or he doesn't actually say that because he focuses on the Lord, we find out the identity of that nation in Micah and Habakkuk. He, we know that he is prophesying what is to come against Judah because of their wickedness. And yet, we know that there is also a coming judgment. And it's described by Jesus as him coming as a righteous judgment, a triumphant glory, a perfect majesty beyond measure, comes as a mighty warrior. But yet, the Lord still offers, and Zephaniah shares of this, still offers a chance for repentance and forgiveness in the second chapter. He still offers a chance for the people of Judah to come back to him. Which leads us to point number two on your outline this morning. All have sinned against the Lord. All have sinned. But repentance is still possible. Verses number 113 of, of chapter 2 says this, so Gather yourselves together, gather together, undesirable nation, before the decree takes effect, and the day passes like chaff, before the burning of the Lord's anger overtakes you, before the day of the Lord's anger overtakes you. Seek the Lord, all you humble on the earth, who carry out what he commands. Seek righteousness, seek humility. Perhaps you will be concealed on the day of the Lord's anger. Right here, though, before we go any further, verses 1 through 3 clearest picture of both the call of repentance right there from the Lord to the nation of Judah from, God, from the evil ways and his coming judgment, but also the people of the world. Verses one through three, they can seek humility. They can seek righteousness. They can seek the Lord. They can turn from their evil ways. Don't miss that in verse three because he t- commands them to repent and believe in God. Then he may conceal them on that day because it sounds like to me that day is going to be pretty crazy, beyond what we can even imagine in terms of his judgment, but he's calling the nation of Judah to come to him. And the verses 4 to 13 kind of give a description of the judgment that is to come on this nation surrounding the nation of Judah because these other nations had also turned from God, and because of their wickedness, he judges them as well. Verse 4 says, for Gaza will be abandoned, and Ashkelon will become a ruin. Ashdod will be driven out at noon, and Ekron will be uprooted. Woe, inhabitants of the seacoast, nation of the Cherethites, the word of the Lord is against you. Canaan, land of the Philistines, I will destroy you until there is no one left. The seacoast will become pasture lands with caves for shepherds and pens for sheep. The coastland will belong to the remnant of the house of Judah. They will find pasture there. They will lie down in the evening among the houses of Ashkelon. For the Lord their God will return to them and restore their fortunes. I have heard the taunting of Moab and the insults of the Ammonites who have taunted my people and threatened their territory. Therefore, as I live... This is the declaration of the Lord of armies, the God of Israel. Moab will be like Sodom and the Ammonites like Gomorrah, a place overgrown with seeds, a salt pit, a perpetual wasteland, weeds throughout. The remnant of my people will plunder them. The remainder of my nation will dispossess them. This is what they get for their pride, the Lord says, because they have taunted and cried arrogantly, acted arrogantly, excuse me, against the people of the Lord of armies. The Lord will be terrifying to them when he starves all the gods of the earth, then all the distant coasts and islands of the nations will bow and worship to him, each in its own place. 
Verse 12, you Cushites will also be slain by my sword, and then you also stretch out his hand against the north and destroy Assyria. He will make Nineveh a desolate ruin, dry as the desert. So right there, even though there's a lot of descriptions, Zephaniah goes into great detail about what the Lord declares he's going to do, and even to the degree of how he will judge the nations around Judah as they had been evil in their wicked ways. So quickly, though, look back at a few of these details with me now because I don't want you to miss how they're being judged as well. Gaza is abandoned. Canaan destroyed until no one is left. Because of the taunting and the pride of Moab and the Ammonites of Israel, God calls them Sodom and Gomorrah, respectively. And we know how well that went the first time for Sodom and Gomorrah. But notice in verse 10 that he indicates it is their what? It is their pride. That is why he calls them as evil as Sodom and Gomorrah and the consequences to come. And then the Lord declares that all distant coasts and islands will bow down. These Syrians will be destroyed and Nineveh will be nothing but a ruin. So it's clear right here that the nations surrounding Judah were also overtaken. Laid waste by the Lord because they were evil. But an instrument being used against them was also Babylon. And again, don't miss this part. Zephaniah doesn't say who is the instrument of God's judgment because he wants to focus on God and his response to the wickedness of the nation of Judah and the surrounding nations. And even as I said, you can find the, the identity in Micah and Habakkuk. It is Zephaniah's focus on God, as it should be our focus on how he is going to act, how he is going to judge, what about his character is going to be revealed to us. And again, it may seem like these details are a lot are over the top of what is happening, what's going to come against the nation surrounding Judah. You know, but I believe it's necessary we kind of walk through a few of these details. Because if you consider the nations then, they were ones of power, ones that had sway, ones that had authority. But guess what? They were still judged. And if you think about it, a lot of those nations sound like nations that we have today, including ours. I mean, how many of the nations of the world can we think of that are a Christian nation that follow the Lord? Um, But if we believe in God and trust in his holy word, then we know and trust that he will judge us judge our nation, and judge every nation on the earth and every people on the world. And that is the truth of the word. But if you, as you think about that, and as I thought about that myself, as I was preparing for the sermon and thinking through and reading through Zephaniah, what about your own heart? What about your own position where you're at this morning? Because we know that the heart was evil. The, hearts, the heart of man was evil in Judah as well as the surrounding nations. But what, what about your own? Where are you at this morning? Romans 3.23 says this, and it's very clear from Paul. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Everyone has fallen short. Every single person will be judged. But don't lose sight here. Don't lose sight in that judgment that God has called people to repent, right? He's given them a way back to him, to seek him. He's allowing people to come back to him. Even now, we should seek the Lord, seek his righteousness, righteousness, and seek a humble heart in him. Because regardless of where you're at this morning, regardless of the day after Christmas, what's going on in your lives, you too can turn to God, repent of your sins, and put your faith in him. Because Romans 10, 9 says, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. You just have to repent and believe. You just have to come to him and believe. And what does repentance even mean? It's a word that's thrown around in church often, but if you think about it, it is a 180 degree turn from where you're going. If you're going this way, it is going the other direction. Absolutely. It is not who you were and what you were before. It is going the opposite way, the complete opposite way. And we believe that way to be towards God. You know, myself, I've had many times where I have been so angry and so frustrated. And usually it's been my pride. It's been whenever I've made a mistake and and my logical mind, I think, well, I shouldn't make that same mistake again. That's why, why should I do that? but it's when I've made the same mistake again. Or I think I've outsmarted myself at times. It's like, I am not going to do that again. No, it's whenever I've done that that I've been so angry, been so frustrated, that I was beside myself, that I I didn't understand why I was doing what I was doing. And I'll be honest, I've had shouting matches with God. I don't know about you, but I have. I've had nowhere else to turn my frustration and my pride, my selfishness, what I think I should do, how perfect I think I should be. And yet the Lord, every single time, hears me, and he loves me anyway. He forgives me and still lets me come back to him, even whenever I have been an affront to him, even whenever I said things I should not. And time and time again, he's shown me that if I turn 180 degrees and follow him as opposed to what I think I should be doing, it is so much better to follow him and to go towards him. 
Even Lamentations 3.22, chapter 3.22 and 23 gives us a good reminder of this, who he is. Because of the Lord's faithful love, we do not perish, for his mercies never end. They are new every single morning. Great is your faithfulness. Great is the faithfulness of God, that despite who we are, despite the nation of Judah and their wickedness, he was still their people, and he is still our God, and we can still come to him. That is good news, that even though all have fallen short, you and I have fallen short, we are so wicked and he is so holy, we could not come to him. The Lord still allowed us to come back to him, and he still wants to restore us to him. He made a way so we could repent and come back to the Father. And that's why point number three, and finally, is that God demonstrates his grace by restoring his people to himself. That restoration, think on that. Because Zephaniah describes that as the Lord lays waste to the power and prestige of the surrounding nations, as well as the Judah, he will gather them to himself to purify them through his judgment and remind them that he is God and God alone. Verses 6 through 8 of chapter 3 says this, I've cut off nations. Their corner towers are destroyed. I've laid waste to their streets with no one to pass through. Their cities lie devastated without a person, without an inhabitant. I said, you will certainly fear me and accept corrections. Then her dwelling place would not be cut off based on all that I had allocated to her. However, they became more corrupt in all their actions. Therefore, wait for me, the Lord says. This is the Lord's declaration until the day I rise up for plunder. For my decision is to gather nations, to assemble kingdoms in order to pour out my indignation to them, all my burning anger. For the whole earth will be consumed by the fire of my jealousy. See, right here in verse 6, Zephaniah describes how the Lord will lay waste to the structure, to the abilities of the nations, to the infrastructure they had, and even the power that they thought they had. Notice, though, because the nation of Judah had not turned from their evil, rebellious ways and did not listen, accepted his correction, accepted his instruction, the Lord declares with absolution, absolution that he will rise up for plunder and pour out indignation against Judah, a righteous indignation, I might say. And this is through a purification This judgment is to purify, one that does not come as utter destruction, but one that is meant to be a holy purification, to pull the nation of Judah back to himself. The remaining verses of chapter 3 end with a promised restoration of this remnant, the ones that were left over after the coming judgment, so that all those dispersed will one day come to the Lord. Look with me now at a few specific verses to finish up chapter 3. For I will then restore pure speech to the peoples, so that all of them may call on the name of the Lord and serve him with a single purpose. See, God will give the people a right speech and a right attitude to worship and serve, serve him and him alone. Verse 12, I will leave a meek and humble people among you, and they will take refuge in the name of the Lord. 13, the remnant of Israel will no longer do wrong or tell lies. A deceitful tongue will not be found in their mouths. They will pasture and lie down with nothing to make them afraid. See, in 12 and 13, the Lord makes it clear here that the nation of Judah will no longer need to fear anything because the Lord is with them and they will find refuge and shelter in the Most High. 15 through 17 says, The Lord has removed your punishment. He's turned back your enemy. The King of Israel, the Lord is among you. You need no longer fear harm. On that day, it will be said to Jerusalem, Do not fear Zion. Do not let your hands grow weak. The Lord your God is among you, a warrior who saves. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will be quiet in his love. He will delight in you with singing. God promises that he will be near as a mighty warrior, to both remove the punishment, but also rejoice over his people to delight in them. Yes, at that time I will deal with all who oppress you, verse 19. I will save the lame and gather the outcasts. I will make those who were disgraced throughout the earth receive praise and fame, excuse me. In verse 20, at that time I'll bring you back. Yes, at that time I will gather you. I will give you fame and praise among the peoples of the earth when I restore your fortunes before your eyes. The Lord has spoken. Even here at the end of chapter 3, the Lord promises to save those that have been discarded, those that have been outcasted, those that have been hurt, to both deal with the oppressors that come against them, but ultimately to restore his people back to himself. See, God promises to Judah, to the rest of his people, that he will restore them and draw them to him. He's made that clear that he will restore them to himself. And you know, even if we hear about this, the nation of Judah and how they'll be restored, we too can find restoration And we can even find evidence of that in Acts chapter 10, where Peter is in the home of centurion, and he's sharing the goodness of the gospel. And all those that were in the room were Gentiles, and the Holy Spirit descended upon them. 
And that is exciting news because you and I can be a part of the family of God. As they were, we can be a part of the family of God. We can be restored to him. We just have to heed his warning. Know that the day of judgment is coming, but that the Lord will restore his people back to him. We just have to take that next step to be reconciled to him. We just have to take that next step towards him. Because as I mentioned earlier, the God of the Old Testament is the same as the God of the New Testament. He's the same yesterday, today, tomorrow, and forever. That God never changes. That is one of his characteristics, of being immutable. That's the word. It means that he does not change, that he is who he says he is. That in his Bible, in the Old Testament, when there we see wrath and we see judgment on the nation of Israel, and then we see loving kindness, mercy, and forgiveness, it's the same God. And that is good news. But because the fact that he is perfectly wrathful, but perfectly forgiving, and he shows us grace in the midst of being just through Jesus, we can find restoration in him. We can find reconciliation to God. All it takes is the repentance of your sins, putting your faith and trust in Jesus and coming to him, regardless where you're at, regardless what's going on in your life. Because the good news is this. Of all the kings of the nation of Israel, none of them were good. None of them lived forever. All of them made mistakes. Even David, as good of a heart as he had, and even him being after God's own heart, he still made mistakes. But the line of David was fulfilled, wasn't it? Because King Jesus still sits on the throne today, and that is good news. So this morning, I just want to encourage you with the truth of the Lord and his intent for each and every one of us. The Lord is coming, but you can still repent of your sins, and you can still be reconciled back to him. See, he wants every single one of us, and every person we meet on the streets, and every family member, and every friend we know that does not know Jesus, or is running hard and far away from him. He wants them to all know that he loves them, and they can come back to him. Because he is righteous in character, and God is jealous for our love, as he deserves it. And he will draw us all back to him. So this morning, right now, you can turn fully back to God. You can take that step towards him, regardless of how you woke up this morning or even wondering how you made it to church. Because we believe, if we believe what he says is in holy word, in his holy word, then we must trust that he will come again. Trust that he will restore us. Trust that we can put our faith and trust in him. See, God made a way back to him through his son, Jesus. And if you believe here today that God sent Jesus to die on the cross. He was born as a baby to live a perfect life and then to, be raised, to rise again, that he is that prophesied king, that he came as a humble Messiah, but he, that he is the Holy One and the only one that can give us hope. Then you can be restored back to God. Then you can find restoration in him. All you have to do is come and repent. Repent and believe in Jesus. In a minute, we're gonna pray. And then I'm gonna challenge each and every one of you to take a next step. If you're here this morning and, and you don't know Jesus, if you don't know who he is or, or you, you don't know even how you got here, you can right there in your seat, you can pray to Jesus to accept him as your Lord and Savior. Again, that idea of what repentance is, realizing that you are broken, realizing that you need him and to cry out to him that I need a Savior, that you need a Savior, to know that you can't do this on your own, that you have no ability to save yourself because you can't. The altar is open this morning. It will be in a minute for you to come forward if you want to pray with me, I'll be down there. I'd love to pray with you. I know there'll be others here that'll pray with you. But what if, what if you are following Jesus as hard as you can? We all have a next step, right? Maybe you need to ask someone to come with you to pray with them. Maybe you just need to come and drop to your knees and cry out to the Father, knowing that even though you are a believer in him, you've not been following him like you should have been. And you have fears on your heart. There are things weighing on you that you can't possibly handle yourself. That's what Jesus wants to know. He wants you to share that with him. I'm the first to admit that I don't like to ask for help. But I've had to fall on my knees and ask the Lord for strength and guidance and direction because I know that I can't do it myself. But perhaps you just need to come and pray and intercede for someone else. The altar is open for you this morning to come and pray. What better, way to, what better thing to do the day after Christmas on a Sunday here in church to go and spend time with Jesus? Nothing better, I don't think. So this morning, what is your next step to come forward? Just come and spend time with him. Come be reconciled to him. Come to him. Repent of your sins, put your faith and trust in him. Would you stand with me as I pray? Father God, this morning, I am grateful, Lord, that you didn't just make us and leave us, God. You did not just create us to leave us where we're at. No, Lord, you give us a purpose. You give us a plan every single day. And God, even if we've known you for a time, perhaps, Father, we've even grew up in church at one point, 
or God, we don't have any idea who you are and we were invited and we showed up this morning. Lord, I pray that you are more real to the people in this room, the people online, Father, the people in Williamsburg and Richmond this morning than you ever have been. I can't imagine how this year has been for everyone. But Lord, I know without a shadow of a doubt, Lord, that you are truth, that you, God, do not waste our pain. When we've had terrible experiences, Lord, you still use that to grow us, to stretch us, but also to give us a witness for those that need to hear it. But Lord, also that you are who you say you are. God, that you are the King, the Messiah, the God, the Yahweh, Jehovah, the Holy One of the Old Testament. And yet, God, you are also the God of the New Testament. And you sent your Son, Jesus, for each and every one of us. So Lord, this morning, I pray, Father, that you will prick the hearts of those that are here. That people will take that step of obedience to come and cry out to you, Lord. The altar is open for people to take a next step. To commune with you, Father. To share what is on their hearts, Lord. Perhaps even to pray with you. But ultimately, Lord, if someone is here that does not know you as the Lord and Savior, I pray that before they leave, Lord, that they will know without a shadow of a doubt that they have given their life to you, Lord. That you are now the Lord of their life. God, thank you this morning for who you are. Father, that we could spend time together in your word. Lord, that even in your Old Testament, even in a minor prophet that most of us probably have never read, Lord, that we can see who you are. That, God, you are holy, truthfully, just, and wrathful. Yes, but, God, you are merciful and loving, and you are just God, and that is awesome. Lord, thank you this morning for that truth that you show to us right now, but also every day. Lord, we thank you for all these things. Father, we give you all this. And it's in your most holy and precious name we pray, Father God. Amen.